press.
Recording in progress. in progress. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening. Hi, Savas. Hello. Hello, hello. Savas. Hello, Savas. Hi, Mrs. Pittman and Mrs. Sars. Good to hear you. Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Thank you. So we're starting tonight with a new book, um, and I'm going to be summarizing it. And this uh, book offers us uh, a more close, uh, a closer analysis of every part of the liturgy goes by every single prayer, explains it, what we're doing, what we're praying, why we're praying, etc. And um, I just now realized, and for those who will watch the recording later, that uh, I didn't share the record, the uh, my audio, so you guys didn't hear the uh, what do you call it? Um, you guys did not hear the what do you call it? The the music. Uh, from earlier until just now. So my apologies for that. I keep forgetting how to do that. Uh, anyways, we're going to shift now on over to 
uh, the text I emailed you guys. Um, let's see here. Okay, here's my screen. Let's see. I'm going to look at... All right. So a while back ago, uh, I emailed you guys this uh, PDF of the Divine Liturgy at a glance, and it shows shape of a church and all the parts of the liturgy. Uh, hopefully you guys have that by you. Uh, if not, bring in next time. Um, the sections that we're going to be looking at here uh, tonight uh, include, you guys can see this, right? The uh, the text or the diagram, I assume? Yes. Yeah, yes, we can see it. Okay, good. So what we're looking at tonight is, I'm going to start with, it's called the Liturgy of the Word. Other times you'll find that it's called Liturgy of the Faithful. Uh, or also the, I'm sorry, it's it's either called the Liturgy of the Word or um, Liturgy of the Catechumens. Uh, reason is because it's at this time that we are allowing the catechumens, those who are preparing to become Orthodox Christians, to attend this part of the liturgy, and they'll be dismissed right before, uh, right after the, um, the gospel. Uh, and then they go to their lessons to learn about the faith, preparing for baptism. So tonight we're looking at, we're going to go up to, where is it? Right here, Only Begotten Son, that hymn. So we're covering this stuff tonight. That's tonight. Um, so there's that. I don't need this diagram now. Here's our text. This is the uh, book there. You guys can see two things, right? On the left, you see the green book and on the left, the text, right? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so this is the beginning of this text. I sent you guys, hopefully you had time to read it. Uh, if not, go back and read it whenever you have time. And tonight I'm going to be summarizing it. Uh, this section is called the Great Litany and the Antiphons. That's another term you can uh, refer to it. So we'll start with a prayer <clears throat> before we get into it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Shine within our hearts, loving Master. With the pure light of your divine knowledge, open the eyes of our mind that we may understand the proclamations of your gospel. Instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments so that trampling down all carnal desires, we may pursue a spiritual way of life, both thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ our God, are the illumination of our souls and bodies, and to you we ascribe glory with your unoriginated Father and your holy, good, and life giving spirit. Not from to the ages of ages. Amen. All right. So you guys can, if you are interested in purchasing this book, it's at New Rome Press. They just updated uh, and revised the text so it doesn't look, does not have a green uh, cover. It has a brown cover. It's leather bound and uh, gold edge paper, I believe. And they fixed a bunch of things up. So I highly encourage uh, you guys to get that if you, are interested otherwise you have the pdf here so get right into it <clears throat> so in the beginning of the liturgy the priest raises up the gospel and he says blessed is the kingdom of the father and the son and the holy spirit now and forever into the ages of ages so when the priest proclaims this we are immediately Ported to heaven. Heaven and earth become one. Not only do we stand in the presence of God, but we are also surrounded by all of the angels and all of the saints, as well as our loved ones who, are, who have passed on from this life to the next. So that's why some, in I, some iconography, as you can see on the left here, you see First off, our churches are built with many icons of the angels and saints all around us because the temple is supposed to convey that reality to us, that we are indeed in heaven. We are indeed in the kingdom of God. Uh, and the angels serve with us and they worship with us alongside next to us. We are standing at the altar 
And the priests and the bishops and deacons, they are co-celebrating the liturgy with some of the greatest saints of our church. St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian. And in addition to all of the saints, the Banagia is there, the angels are there, our loved ones are there, so on and so forth. <clears throat> this is because the saints are alive in God. They're not dead. They're alive in God. I want to give you an analogy of this. So oftentimes when a plane, right, think about an airplane, when it's about to take off, the pilot will announce the destination of the plane so that everyone on board is reminded of where he or she is headed. So the opening statement of the divine liturgy, blesses the kingdom, is somewhat similar. The, the middle part of the church is called the nave. In Latin, the translation of that word is actually comes from the word ship. So in essence, the parishioners who are seated in a ship are being reminded by the captain, the priest of the plane, that where they are heading is the kingdom of God, is heaven, right? So something to think about. We're also heading to the great banquet of the master, Luke chapter 14, Matthew chapter 26, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Christ invites us to his great banquet. He serves us. He invites us as his guests to eat and drink at his own table, to eat and drink of his own life-giving body and blood, which nourishes and quenches our spiritual thirst. At the same time, as the priest says, blesses the kingdom, he is also blessing and glorifying God. And we too must try to bless and glorify and give thanks to God at all times in all circumstances. As St. Paul says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And finally, the priest here is also proclaiming a statement of faith that we believe in the Holy Trinity and that we believe in eternal life and we believe in heaven. And that's not just something that we believe, but something we experience as Orthodox Christians. We are in heaven itself, as St. John Chrysostom says, heaven itself. So then he makes, like I said, he also makes, oh, I wanted to uh, add one more thing here, I forgot. So because of this awesome reality that we're in heaven, let us try to not come to liturgy late. Let's try to not come even right on time because as one of my professors says, if you're right on time, you're late. <laughs> so meaning we, we should come to church say at least 10, 15 minutes beforehand, light our candles, kiss the icons, come prepare, get in that, into that mode, that spiritual mode of being so that we're not, we're not coming there with our minds distracted with the bills we gotta pay, the events we're going to later on or anything. We clear our minds totally and we come to focus strictly and solely on God himself. And in addition to that, I would also say, Stay, stay for the entirety of the divine liturgy. Don't leave early unless there is some uh, valid excuse that you can give, say, you know, um, I don't even know what, but uh, if you have some good reason to leave, have a blessing for Father to do so, but without, uh, besides that very exceptional situation, uh, we should be staying at church from beginning to end as much as we can uh, because uh, just as we want to spend time with our family and friend, friends uh, as long as we want, because we love them in the same way, staying for the entirety of the liturgy is an expression of our love for Christ. Um, so that is that. All right, so he makes the sign of the cross with the gospel. And he, uh, when he says this, why? reason why is the cross is the symbol of the kingdom. Um, the cross is Christ's weapon with which he destroyed and defeated the devil, 
death and sin. It is a sign of victory and hope and joy. Sign of the cross is a sign of victory, hope, joy, and joy. And salvation, ultimately salvation. It was by the cross that we gained salvation, that we gained the kingdom of God, which we are experiencing in the liturgy. We too can be victorious over sin and the devil by connecting ourselves to Christ through Holy Communion, which is why we're there at liturgy, in which Christ cry, in which case Christ will defeat these evil things for us. He'll do it through us. We must rely on Christ at all times, call out to him for help, and he will give us the strength and help us to escape sin, temptations, and demonic attacks. God will protect us. Even during COVID and anything else, we should be making this a sign, the sign of the cross over ourselves, asking Christ and the saints to protect us. There's nothing wrong with it. But if anything, we should be doing that more than ever. Another really interesting thing to think about here is in the garden, right? Genesis, Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree, forbidden tree, and they died. But Christ... He is the fruit of the tree of the cross. And when we eat of his body and blood, we are truly alive. We truly live and have eternal life within us. So then after that, the, the people, all of us, we say the amen. We conclude with the amen. We are participants in the liturgy, right? The word liturgy comes from the Greek word liturgy which means work of the people. So we're there actively participating, right? And when we say the word amen, we are in reality saying that we agree. We agree. We are saying, so be it. We're giving our approval. The liturgy cannot be celebrated without the people. And I don't know if you knew that, but a priest cannot celebrate liturgy by himself where that's something that uh, Roman Catholics can do, but in the Orthodox tradition, we um, we can't do that because uh, liturgy is the work of the people, and you need at least one person other than the priest there to say the amens and the Lord have mercies and so on and so forth. Um, so there is that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, where is this? Look for the people. Yeah, I uh, just look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and you'll see St. Paul saying um, the importance of uh, community, the importance of our own participation in liturgy. Um, so the next prayer. Now I'm going to, in order to distinguish my uh, summary from the actual prayers, I'm going to intone some of these so that way you can distinguish it. So the next uh, prayer that we say in the liturgy is, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. And of course, we say, Lord, have mercy. So first off, um, I'll explain this. The word uh, mercy comes from the Greek word meaning ele eleon. It comes, uh, it's a derivative of eleon, which actually means oil. And uh, in the olden days, and I think even to this own day, there are actually medicinal um benefits to oil i don't know if you guys do that but uh if you go, for example if you read the parable of the uh good samaritan the good samaritan pours wine and oil on the man's bandages to heal him uh in the same way christ's mercy heals us he heals us by his mercy so we are asking god to heal us to strengthen us to illumine us to bless us and to feed us spiritually speaking in these when we say lord have mercy i was just at the monastery a few weeks ago and one of the nuns had said god's mercy is everything for us it's everything for us anything we are missing that can be fulfilled with god's mercy so um here we're saying we need to be at peace the deacon or the priest are saying this He's saying we need to be at peace when we come to the divine liturgy. We cannot have any worries or fears or concerns. We need to be completely subdued and paying attention only to the liturgy and 
participating in it. Uh, be engaged and participate. Don't allow yourself to drift off by various other thoughts or distractions. Sin, however, is ultimately what causes us to be internally agitated, troubled, uncomfortable, angry, irritated, etc. And demons know what bothers us the most. We must know how to defend ourselves from such spiritual attacks. Always be on guard and alert. Watchfulness is one of the greatest virtues that we can acquire through the grace of God. And you might ask, well, then how can I acquire peace? What are some ways that I can acquire peace? And according to the fathers of the church, true peace is from above. St. Isaac, is that St. No. Who is that from? St. Basil, I think. He says, true peace comes from God. Christ is our peace. Christ is our peace. He's our peace. He gives us peace when we ask for it with all our heart, mind, and soul. And we can also acquire peace through the various mysteries of the church, Holy Communion, of course. But of course, above all, well, I should say above all, but it goes without saying that peace, which is one of the characteristics of Christ, can also be given to us when we live like Christ himself. I just recently came across a text the other day that the Jesus prayer, the Jesus prayer, if we are constantly repeating the Jesus prayer throughout the day, you'll experience the peace of God. That's why the St. Paul says to pray without ceasing. That's why I have a prayer up here as an image for that. Let's see what else. Being at peace also means not having ill feelings toward anyone. You can't come to liturgy being angry or upset unless we're there to ask God to take those away from us. But we must come with peace of mind, heart, and soul. And Christ says in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 and 6, He will not forgive us if we do not first forgive those who have offended us or if we ask for forgiveness from those whom we have upset. So we must be reconciled to both God and man. We need the vertical and the horizontal, right? Which makes the sign of the cross. We have to be at peace with both God and man. And so in order for our prayers during the divine liturgy to fully be answered and to be fully uh, fulfilled, for them to be Receiving as much benefit as possible, we need to be at peace. We need to be quiet. We need to be calm so that our prayers can reach up to God for our own benefit. So the next petition is... For the peace from on high and the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. So first, in the previous prayer, let us in peace, let us pray to the Lord. The church is instructing us how to pray. How to pray, which is peacefully. we got to pray peacefully. And now the church is telling us what we should be praying for. We're praying for, first off, the peace of God, which is righteousness and virtue. That's what the peace of God is. Peace from on high is righteousness and virtue. And the salvation of our souls is the kingdom of God. Salvation of our souls is the kingdom of God as well as becoming purified and cleansed from sin. Being deified, becoming like Christ and illumined with the light of Christ. To become like Christ entirely and fully filled with his grace and energy so that we can be transformed into his likeness. See, Athanasio says, God became man so that man could become like God. God became man so that man could become like God. It's a very famous quote. Through Christ's own voluntary crucifixion, through his crucifixion, he reconciles us with God and he makes us friends with the angels. Sin is what alienates us from God, 
while Christ unites us to God. So through his peacemaking sacrifice on the cross, we are able to overcome any and all obstacles that separate us from the kingdom of God. And of course, in the divine liturgy, we are, part, we are partaking of that sacrificial victim, that sacrificial meal that was shed and sacrificed on the cross, the body and blood of Christ. And through him, we are at peace with God. When Christ comes into us through Holy Communion, we have the gentle King of all within us who grants us his own peace. And, of course, we must, we must, we must try our best in preserving that peace as the week goes on, preserving that peace through prayer, through reading of scriptures in the lives of the saints, fasting, uh, keeping the commandments, etc. Next prayer for the peace from for the for the peace of the whole world, for the stability of the holy churches of God, and for the union of all. Let us pray to the Lord. <clears throat> when all Orthodox Christians are at peace with each other, this is what produces the stability in the holy churches of God. This is what produces peace, stability order and holiness within the parish and even our own communities, Canton, Ohio and beyond. Christ wants to give peace to the world through us. We are his tools. And as we pray here for the union of all that, all the heterodox, all the non-Orthodox will become united to the church and become Orthodox Christians. For their own salvation. We are also praying at this time for peace throughout the world, that there will be no wars, no divisions, no political divisions, no fights, no nothing, just utter and total peace. We pray for that. And it is obvious that sin is what is the root cause of divisions today sin and pride and arrogance so whenever we feel burdened by the worries and the fears and cares of this life we should run should run to the holy temple so that we can acquire the peace of god next prayer for this holy house for those who enter it with faith reverence and the fear of god let us pray to the lord before I go on to that, I want to also, I forgot to mention at the beginning here, uh, God willing, uh, you guys are able to be taking notes uh, and whatnot. So at the end of this, I actually want to ask you guys at least one thing that you learned. What is one thing that you learned that was new? Okay, I'm going to ask you guys that at the end, all right? So be, be, uh, what do you call it? Engaged listeners and participants, please, for your own good, not for my sake. I'm not here for myself. I'm here for you. Um, all right. So the next prayer for this holy house, for those who enter with faith, reverence, and the fear of God, let us pray to the Lord. There it is. The church is heaven on earth. Church is heaven on earth. It's not your grocery store. It's not your uh, dirty uh, laundry room. It's not any of those things. It's heaven on earth. There is no sickness or illness in the kingdom of God. There is none. So this is one thing that many of us have not done uh, in the last year in last year and a half is entering the Holy Temple with respect and awe before God. Because we've introduced things that are, according to the saints, Irreverent, disrespectful. St. Paisio says that treating holy things as though they could be conduits of disease is irreverence. It's sacrilege. It's disrespectful. So we need to be approaching the holy things with faith, with trust, with love, with all, with respect, not irreverence, not, not faithlessness, but with faith. There's a quote here. From St. John Chrysostom, it says, Just as a calm and sheltered harbor 
provides great security to the ships moored there. So does the temple of God. So does the temple of God provide great security. When people enter it, it snatches them away from worldly affairs as from a storm and gives them the capacity to stand and listen to God's words in calm and security. See, there it is. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. This place is the bedrock of virtue and the school of spiritual life. You only need to sit on the threshold of a church and at once you are liberated from the cares of daily life. Go on into the church and a spiritual dew will envelop your soul. The stillness there moves you to all and teaches you how to live spiritually. It elevates your thoughts and prevents you from remembering anything or matters belonging to the present life. It transports you from earth to heaven. And if there is such a great gain from simply being in a church when no service is going on, then how much benefit will people derive from being present when the holy apostles proclaim the gospel? Christ stands in our midst. See, he's there. He's in front of us. God the Father receives the mysteries that are performed, and the Holy Spirit gives us his joy. Where are our spiritual leaders today teaching us these things? Drawing from the saints that tell us not to be afraid in the Holy Temple. Not to be afraid in the Holy Temple. As we saw in Lesson 2, the saints teach that the Holy Temple is a sacred space in which we receive life, good health, strength, and protection. Those are direct quotes, by the way. From God and the angels, thereby rendering the Holy Temple a center capable of in, incapable, incapable of infectious diseases, but it is a center of curing infectious diseases. And this goes for all of the holy things, icons, the priest's hand, the holy spoon, etc. If you want more on that, look at video number two on the Holy Temple. So another thing here. <clears throat> let's see here. Another thing is we go to the temple, the church building, so that we will become ourselves a temple of the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit to come in and dwell within us. We go there to become a living temple of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> if you go John chapter 1, verse 14, a lot of translations will say that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But if you look at the original Greek, it actually says that the word became flesh and dwelt in us. And we beheld his glory and the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And of course, above all, he comes within us and dwells within us through Holy Communion. We have his own body and blood rain, uh, running through our own veins. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. St. Silouan the Athenite says, I live in a cave. My body is a cave for my soul. And my soul is a cave for the Holy Spirit. Such a beautiful quote. I love that. <clears throat> and he was a modern saint from our own times too. So God is not a God who is aloof and far away from us, but a God who is close, imminent, personal, intimate. He loves us and wants to have a close relationship with us. He is, in fact, closer to us than our own skin and bones, according to St. Nicholas Cabasilas. Imagine that. That's how intimate we are with Christ in the Holy Eucharist. So the next prayer. For our Archbishop, obviously commemorate the local bishop, in this case, Savas, for the Honorable Order of Presbyters, for the Diaconate Christ, and all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. <clears throat> I don't know why I scribbled that out. That's weird. Oh, all right, I'll have to look at that later. It's strange. Some of this, uh, some of these apps get messed up whenever I'm doing uh, my notes. Kind of weird. Anyways, so here we're praying for all the Orthodox clergy and people. In the church, we have three major orders, bishop, priest, and deacon. There are also minor clerical orders, subdeacon, exorcist, reader, and doorkeeper. The doorkeeper back in the days is when uh, they would be in the back of the church and they would make sure that the doors 
were closed at certain times throughout services so that the non-Orthodox would not be permitted in, especially for liturgy, because the liturgy is for the Orthodox, and also to protect the sanctity of the space so that others don't come in and ruin things and mock things and, you know, things of that sort. Uh, it's only the initiated there um, that are permitted in the services. And to also keep good order, um, you know, if you came to ch if you came to church late, you weren't permitted in. That's just the way it used to be back in the day. Um, and during the liturgy, later on, we'll see when the priest says, uh, "What is it? The doors, the doors, and wisdom must be attentive." Um, right before the creed in Greek, that's uh, what is that? Um, I forget. Anyways, that's when the uh, doorkeepers would shut the doors, actually, in the back of the church. Um, so, yeah. Um, the 12 disciples were the first bishops of the church. They ordained other men as bishops so that they could continue on their apostolic ministry, their work. And this process continued on from one generation to the next all the way down to us today. So that means that our bishops today have a direct line to the apostles. They are the successors of the original 12 disciples themselves. And for that, we call this process apostolic succession. And it is one of the defining marks or traits that prove that we are the church which Christ built, as he says in Matthew chapter 16, and which we say in the creed, and in one holy Catholic apostolic church, we are apostolic because we base our teachings, our practices, our way of life on the teachings of the apostles who themselves re receive those teachings from Christ. So Christ continues to work through the bishops and the priests. So that's why the saints say that we should look upon the bishops and even the priests as though we're looking upon Jesus Christ himself. And so since the priest is the representative of the bishop, we should look upon him as though he were Christ. And when we receive a blessing from the priest and kiss his hand, we are literally kissing the hand of Jesus Christ himself and receiving a blessing directly from him. That's why the pre when we go up to a priest and we say, Father, bless, he says the Lord's blessing. It doesn't say my blessing. It says the Lord's blessing. And as St. Nicholas Cabasilas, for example, says, the hands of Christ are pure. Therefore, the hands of the priest cannot transmit illness or disease because it's the hand of Christ. Next prayer. Beautiful Chicago. Love it. For this city, every city, country, and for the faithful who dwell in them, let us pray to the Lord. We're praying for all people throughout the entire world, because as Christians, we are called to love all people unconditionally. Christians were called to equally love each other, all people, no matter who they are, no matter what political ideology they line up, no matter what, how evil they are, we're supposed to love them because Christ loves them. Christ loves the worst of sinners as much as he loves, the same amount of love as he loves with the saints doesn't show any partiality to one person over the other. He sees us all equally. And if we cannot, if we're struggling with this in our lives, we must ask God to help us. Ask him to help us love those who are unlovable, so to say. Those who are difficult to love. See. Next prayer here. For favorable weather and abundance of the fruits of the earth and the temperate seasons, let us pray to the Lord. We're praying that God will continue to sustain and preserve and provide for us through the various elements of the earth. Everything in creation is a direct gift from God. 
to direct you from God. Everything comes from God. Even the smallest of things, it's from God directly. And for that, we should be thanking God for everything. When you open up a can of soup, thank God for it. He's giving it to you. And we're also asking the Lord to provide for us so that ultimately we have more time and resources that will help us to extend our lives long enough for us to repent. We're asking the Lord to prolong our life on this earth, none other than for the very reason to grow closer to him, to repent, to live a life of holiness. And that's why for us Christians, it's death is not supposed to be scary or anything like that because we know that this life is not the end all be all. There's another life awaiting us. Christ has destroyed death through his resurrection. We are all priests. We're all priests. We're all priests of creation. What do I mean by this? So a priest is someone who offers things to God, right? In our own churches, we the priest offers the bread and wine to God. In the same way, we are supposed to offer our very lives to Christ, to offer our, our will to Christ, to offer everything to Christ, to offer our food to Christ, so that he will bless it, to offer Christ everything. We must reject our own ego and live according to the will of God. And we also need to offer up the creation, especially bread and wine in the liturgy, so that in turn, in turn, we don't just offer up God and then that's it. We offer the creation up to Christ so that in turn, he turns it back to us and gives it back to us, transformed and transfigured for our own blessing, our own sanctification, our own salvation. So that means that cycle of offering never stops. We give so that we can be given. We give to be given. We give to be given. <clears throat> Nothing in the creation is bad. All things are good because Christ created them and he is a good God. It's only when we misuse things is when they become corrupted and sinful. Nothing created by God is evil. It's not food that is evil, but gluttony. Not the begetting of children, but unchastity. Not material things, but avarice. Not esteem, but pride. It is only the misuse of things that are evil, not the things themselves. St. Maximus, the confessor. Cannot allow anything to control us. Cannot allow anything to become our master. We cannot be slaves to things. We must be in charge. We must be able to have enough self-control to be able to reject the bad and accept the good. For those who travel by land, sea, and air. For those who travel by land, sea, or air, let us, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Here we are praying. Here we are praying that everyone, especially those who are sick and suffering, that their struggles will become a path to salvation and holiness. In our sufferings, we can learn how to be more patient, more humble, more kind, more compassionate, more loving in our own sufferings and the sufferings of others. We learn to be like Christ. And that's what we're praying for in this prayer. When we suffer, we are actually participating in the sufferings of Christ. And according to one of the saints I read a couple semesters ago, Christ will recognize in us his own sufferings and award us for them if, if we bear those sufferings with patience and humility and thanksgiving. Those are the presuppositions. Christ is the only one. He is the only one who can give us rest and peace and strength and healing. And he, in fact, does it in and through his temple and the holy mysteries. It's a beautiful quote here from Saints 
It says Christ invites us into his church and to the divine liturgy because, quote, in the house of God is joy for those who are in distress, gladness for those who are sorrow, comfort for those who are tormented, rest for those who are weary. Only we listen to the saints during this COVID stuff where we have prov provided people with those things, my goodness. For Christ says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. What is more welcome than these words? What is more delightful than this invitation? When the Lord invites you to his church, he is inviting you to a festival. He's asking you to rest from your labors, labors, wedding express will care. What a heavenly invitation. We shouldn't look at church as something, oh, I gotta go to church today. Oh, it's boring. Oh, it's hard. It's it's this, it's that. No, it should be in the spirit of joy and, and excitement to go to church. That should be our disposition. That should be our disposition. Next prayer. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and constraint or distress. Sometimes the text says, let's pray to the Lord and help us, save us, have mercy on us. Keep us, O oh God, by your grace. All right. I want to read these box quotes here. We're coming to an end here soon. God permitted man to taste pain in order to heal the wound caused by him by sin. Immediately after the sin of our forefathers, God allowed death and pain not to punish those who had sinned, but rather to offer a medicine to those who had fallen sick. What well, looks to us like a punishment is actually a divine therapy. It sounds like a penalty and a punishment when you hear in the sweets of your brow shall you eat bread. But in reality, however, it is an admonition, a corrective chastisement, a corrective chastisement, a medicine for the wounds caused by sin. So you think about it this way. You have a wound in your arm. You need to get it cured. Perhaps you've got to go through surgery. It's painful. It sucks. It's uncomfortable. But through that pain, you're going to be healed. That's the ultimate purpose of the surgery is so that you'll be healed and you'll be saved from your sufferings and won't progress to becoming worse. The same way God sometimes punishes us in various ways uh, as a means to correct our bad behavior in order to correct us and turn us away from sin. Let's say someone committed a sin and God punishes them by, I don't know, um, you know, causing them to get in a car accident or something like that. In that way, God is trying to, uh, you know, wake them up and say, hey, you got to realize that what you're doing is not good for your soul. It's not good for your salvation. Much worse thing is going to happen to you in all of eternity in the next life if you don't shape up and change your ways. Sometimes we need that harsh wake-up call if we've gone too far off the road. And um, it just, we have to realize that God sometimes does these things not out of revenge, not out of anger, but out of love and concern. Just like a mother and father, when they see their son or daughter go to touch the hot stove, they're going to slap their hand and say, no, 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 no touching that stove because it's going to hurt you, right? And the parents would much rather have the child feel the pain of a little slap than a burn mark, right? So that the child knows not to touch the hot stove. Um, or if they did, to teach them not to do it again. So it's all about pedagogy. It's all about teaching, right? Um, let's see what else. Regards to uh, sufferings, illnesses, diseases, viruses, etc. Let's not pretend like God is not our helper. Let's not pretend, let, let's put it this way. Let's not, we got to ask ourselves, especially now during this time when, you know, these vaccines are being thrown out at us and being pressured to get these experimental agents uh, that have a lot of questionable data. Um, we have to ask ourselves, are we putting our trust more in men than in God? Who are we running to first when we're alive in this God, in this life? Are we running first to God and the saints who offer us healing? Do we go to their icons? Do we go to their relics? Do we ask the priest to anoint us with holy oil? Do we go to confession? Do we go to communion first? Or do we put our faith and trust in corrupt corporations and groups and things of that sort? We have to ask ourselves that. We do. Let's see here. When we are praying that we'll be free of necessity, what we're saying is that we're asking God that we be free 
from coercion. And that we be free from anything that tries to take away our freedom and free will. If we're addicted to something, our free will is limited. We're limiting our own free will. We want to be free. We're created to be free. And we want to be free. St. John Chrysostom says, the more you need something, the more your freedom is restricted. The passions, sinful desires and impulses restrict our freedom because we become slaves to them. Quote here, 134. All right, where is it? Right here. Yeah, the more you need something, the more your freedom is limited. Let us get rid of this terrible slavery and finally become free. Why do we invent all kinds of endless bonds for ourselves? It is truly desirable and expedient to cut away anything that binds us and seizes the heavenly city. There you have it. Is that another? Yeah. This is interesting down here. Often we form a gathering of frightened and anxious disciples, a gathering of believers who have closed the doors of their hearts to the super super rational love of mere bearing souls and those hopes whose hopes for the heavenly kingdom barely flicker. The mere bearers in every age shut their eyes to dangers, while those of little faith shut their hearts to hope. So the mere bearers went to the tomb of Christ, even though they could have gotten arrested and killed by the Jews who were guarding the tomb. And yet they still went. They still went. In our own time, we have to ask ourselves, do we have that kind of bravery, that kind of love for Christ to put aside our fears and our worries and be motivated by our love for Christ enough to go to God's temple and visit him and spend time with him? We really Are we willing to suffer the consequences for being faithful Christians and followers and disciples of Jesus Christ like the saints? Do we realize that by our faithfulness, if we suffer in this life for our faithfulness to Christ, we will be rewarded in the next life for all of eternity? We should be thinking about that. Where are our priorities? We should be thinking about that, asking ourselves that, challenging ourselves for that so that we can grow as Christians. And when we go to the temple, if, if we're going to the temple afraid, we got to realize that we got to we got to get over that. We got to get over that that fear. We have to get over being scared because we must realize Christ is our protector. The saints are our our protectors. And if anything bad happens to us, if we put ourselves and trust ourselves to Christ and the saints, even if something bad happens, we know that it's for our own good. So for our own good, our own salvation, our own benefit. Read the life of St. Victoria of Carthage. There was a time when it was illegal to go to church. She still went and they celebrated liturgy. She was arrested. They asked her, why did you go to church, celebrate liturgy when it's illegal? She said, because going to church and receiving the Eucharist is indispensable. There simply is no such thing as being a Christian without the Eucharist. That's what she said, direct quote. Imagine what that says to us today. And finally, over here, we say in the liturgy, we're praying to the Panagia, commemorating our all holy, pure, blessed, and glorious lady, the Theotokos and Ever Virgin Mary, with all the saints, let us entrust our, I just got done saying that, let us entrust ourselves and one another, our whole life to Christ our God. It doesn't say entrust ourselves to the scientists or to the politicians, or first to Christ, first to the saints to them. The word commemorating, sometimes it's remembering. I can't think of what the Greek word is there. I want to say it's remembering, but commemorating is the same thing. It means calling, commemorating, the word commemorating means calling to our aid, our help, or beseeching right there. Calling to our aid. Um, there's also another reason why we beseech the Theotokos for her aid. The act of entrusting our lives to the Lord is something analogous to her own dedication to God. Mother of God at the age of three was dedicated to the Lord 
in order to become his living throne. And in a similar way, every believer is offered to the Lord in order to become his dwelling place. On the day of her entry into the temple, the virgin went to be dedicated as a dwelling for the ruler of all. The divine liturgy, the celebrant, exhorts us to dedicate ourselves to Christ so that he may dwell within us. He exhorts us to become like the most pure virgin, the dwelling place of Jesus, beautiful and lovely. St. Maximus Confessor says that all Christians should become Theotoki, Theotoki, meaning we should all become like the Theotokos, we should emulate her, imitate her, to become and make that space in which Christ comes to dwell. But of course, the presuppositions to that, the prerequisites for that, is that we're living in obedience to Christ, we're living in humility, we're living in purity, so that we are worthy enough to have Christ within us. In that, in that prayer, where is it? So right here, let us entrust ourselves. Another word that's usually put there, some, uh, a similar, uh, how do you say, a synonym is uh, commend. Let us commend ourselves. The word, the Greek word for commend, actually, it's really beautiful. It actually means, uh, comes from the Greek word parathometha. This word, which comes from the word paratithimi, actually means, quote, sacrificially submit. Sacrificially submit. In other words, we must sacrifice and let go of our ego and submit to the will of God. Obey Christ. Live according to his will for our own salvation. Beautiful. So then we have, where is it? Right there. The priest says in a low voice, sometimes you'll hear them say it out loud, but usually it's in a low voice, say this prayer. Lord our God, whose might is ineffable and whose glory is beyond understanding, whose mercy is without measure, and whose love for mankind is beyond all telling, look down upon us and upon this holy house. Did you see that? Holy house. It's not just a regular building. Master, and according to your loving kindness, and bestow on us and on those who pray with us your acts of abundant mercy and compassion. Do you belong, O glory, on and worship to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and forever and to the age of ages. Amen. Christ, being the God of all, beyond time, beyond space, all powerful, all knowing, even though he is the master and the king of all, was humble and came and dwelt in the virgin womb for nine months, willingly submitted himself to the limitations of human nature. He was hungry, he was thirsty, he was tired. Right? He willingly endured pain and suffering. Why? Because he loves us. He loves us, that's why. That's why he became human, because he loves us. And that love defies all description. He can't even describe it, can't even possibly pinpoint it. It's just beyond human reason and understanding. He loves us so much. And we should strive to love him as much as we can as well. Christ is our friend. Christ is our friend. There's a quote here. There it is. Same so on here on the left. A certain monk told me that when he was very sick, his mother said to his father, Oh, how our little boy is suffering. I would gladly give myself to be cut up into pieces if that would ease his suffering. Such is the love of God for people. He pitied people so much that he wanted to suffer for them. Like their own mother and even more. But no one can understand this great love without the grace of the Holy Spirit. Wow. And there's saints who have, by the grace of God, experienced that love of God internally in their souls. And it's like a, they'll describe it in different ways. Sometimes they'll say it feels like a sweet joy, blissfulness. Others will say it's like a warm hug that's squeezing your insides and you can't help yourself but fall into tears.
Where is it? All right. So God wants to be with us at all times. He's the God of love. He calls every single one of us to himself in his house. All of us. Did you hear that? All of us, not some of us. There's no such thing as social distancing. There's no such thing as limiting people in the house of God. Christ says in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, compel them to come in so that my house is full. Doesn't say only five people or 25 people. It says so that it's full. Christ does not discriminate, does not segregate. Matthew chapter 9. Christ was preaching in his own house. And what do we read? The house was jammed, packed. So much that there was people on the outside of the house because of how many were there. Christ never turned anyone away. He greatly desires that all of us who are spiritually sick with the virus of sin, that we all come to him for healing. Forgive me for saying this, but shame on us for not obeying Christ. We fail to obey God's own command to let everyone in his house. God forgive us. And you might say, oh, COVID is out. You know, it's pretty much over. And can we just stop talking about COVID? Well, what's that one saying? Those who don't know their history are bound to repeat it. If only we keep that in mind, we will, God willing, not repeat our mistakes. All right, so that is the ending of that long list of prayers that the deacon or the priest will say. And then we transition into hymns, which are called antiphons. The word antiphon or antiphonal singing is when you have two chanters or two choirs chant back and forth with each other. And this practice was actually introduced by St. Ignatius of Antioch in the first century. So um, how you see in churches, how you'll have chanters on the right side and chanters on the left, that's not because of COVID social distancing. I mean, that we, for instance, at Holy Trinity, we did that uh, during COVID, unfortunately, but uh, the blessing behind that was the fact that we actually remain faithful to a very ancient tradition of the church. Uh, at school, uh, it's always been that way where we have right and left choirs and they go back and forth singing. So you'll have here, you're gonna have um, the first hymn that we chant is by the prayers of the Theotoko, Savior, save us, right? Um, before we chant that, though, uh, there are verses that are intoned, like, bless the Lord of my soul and everything within me, bless his holy name, right? And then we go through the prayers of the Theotokos, and so on and so forth. Those verses are um, specifically selected uh, that are specific to that day. So if we're celebrating, let's say, uh, the Annunciation, the verses are going to be curtailed according to the Feast of Annunciation. And those verses are coming from the Book of Psalms, right? Um, and so the purpose of those verses is not just so that we can be in a mode of thinking about the feast and to help us celebrate the feast, but also those verses are prophecies. They're prophesying the coming of Christ and they're preparing us for the coming of Christ in Holy Communion just as they helped the Jews and all of the world, the coming of Christ to earth, the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. So according to the Tipikon, which is the guidebook for services, how they're supposed to, you know, uh, their format and their structure, how things are supposed to go, according to the Tipikon, we're actually supposed to chant, this is, uh, uh, yeah, we're supposed to chant here what's called the Tipika, the Tipika, which is Psalm 102, uh, with additional hymns tacked on at the ending that are related to the day's celebration. So instead of singing through the prayers of the Theotokos, we're actually supposed to sing Psalm 102. Um, it's only on days of, where is it? Yeah, we only are supposed to chant through the prayers of the Theotokos 
on feast days of Christ or Panagia. If it's not a feast day of, the, of Christ or Panagia, then we're supposed to chant Psalm 102 here. You might say, well, why don't we do that, Salva? Well, in some parishes they do, the monasteries they do. The only explanation I really can come up with why some parishes don't do this is because of laziness. They want to speed through the services. They want to skip things. They don't want to extend the service. They want to shortcut, short it, whatever, short, uh, cut it short. Um, I don't really know why, how that, you know, what other reason people would not be faithful to what the church tells us what to do other than that. It's just they want to skip things, I guess, or, you know, shorten services, which is, you know, uh, really just a, um, we're neglecting things for our own, our own benefit. Um, and these hymns of the church also cleanse us of sin because they're full of grace. So then, um, let's see here. Where are we at? Then we, after these hymns, the deacon will go again, again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord, and says those, you know, prayers help us, save us, and commemorating, right? Um, so here, uh, the reason why we're repeating these prayers is because the clergy are calling us to pay attention, pray peacefully and attentively, pay attention, don't drift off, focus. Um, and we're supposed to be praying in a mood of peacefulness, right? Um, we're also asking for a greater level or a greater, a greater depth of experiencing God's grace and blessings. Grace has no limit. That is why these prayers are repeated and they will be repeated later. We are also repeating them because we are expressing our great desire to become closer and closer to God and the saints. We want more grace. We are yearning. We're craving for communion with God and the saints. And then the priest has another Small prayer, silently or sometimes out loud. Lord our God, save your people, bless your inheritance, protect the fullness of your church. Wow, look at that. We ask God to actually protect us. Huh. Sanctify those who love the beauty of your house. Glorify them in return by your divine power and do not forsake us who hope in you. For yours is the might, kingdom, power, and glory, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So here on Mount Athos, they will sing, um, they'll sing at the prayers of your saints, save us, O Lord. That's an Athenite monastic tradition. But uh, in the parishes, we chant, Save us, O Son of God, who are risen from the dead. We chant to you, Alleluia. And if it's, that's on Sunday. So if it's Sunday, we say, Save us, O Son of God, who are risen from the dead. Because Sundays is the commemoration of the resurrection. So every, every Sunday is a little Pascha. And then during the week, uh, it changes to save us, O Son of God, who are wondrous in or among the saints. To you we sing alleluia, right? Um, through baptism, we have become citizens of heaven and children of God. Through his, crucif who, uh, sorry, through his crucifixion and resurrection, Christ has given us freedom from the sins and passions. We share and participate in his crucifixion and resurrection through baptism. The question is, do we activate that grace in our lives to be free from sin? Are we repenting? Or are we slaves to sin? On Mano yeah, I said that about Manathos. And again, even here, according to the Tipikon, we're supposed to chant the Beatitudes. Um, unless it's a major feast of the Lord upon a year. In which case we chant, save us, O Son of God, who are one, Jesus, and the saints. Um, and then after this hymn, we transition into a 5th century hymn. To a 5th century hymn that was written by Emperor Justinian. I believe he's a saint in the church. I'm not sure. Uh, and that hymn goes like this. Only, only begotten Son and Word of God, who being immortal, accepted for our salvation to take flesh from the Holy Theotokos and have a Virgin Mary. We're learning about that next week. And without change became man. You were crucified, O Christ of God, by death, trampling on death, being one of the Holy Trinity, glorified with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Save us. God is not a God who is proud, but one who meets us on our level. He accepted to become man, he underwent everything proper to humanity, to human nature, except for sin. He never sinned, but he 
he experienced everything that you and I experienced. And he's help, able to help those who are tempted by sin, as St. Paul says, because he himself knows what that's like, though he never sinned. St. John Chrysostom says, oh, you can read that later. It just basically, I don't want to uh, hold us up for too much, but you can read that. It talks about the incarnation. Christ became man so that he could combat the devil and overcome him in battle. And we too can become triumphant over sin and the devil through connecting ourselves to Christ by Holy Communion. Christ will give us the strength and the power to do that. And then we do another litany. This is what it's called, another litany. Again and again in peace, let's pray to the Lord. It's repeating these same prayers. Um, this is very, very, very significant right here. I want to read you because it's very significant. It talks about the importance of coming to church. Come to church in person. So here it says, The church building too as the place where the assembly of the faithful takes place expresses this communion of love. Churches came into being not so that we who come together should be divided, but so that we who are divided should be united. This is shown by the Eucharistic assembly. We come together in liturgy. On the Lord's day, there is a gathering of all the faithful in the same place. Not some online, some over there, some at home. No, we're all in the same place in the church. And then we all stand and pray. We stand and pray. We don't sit and pray. We stand and pray. After that, bread and wine and water are offered to celebrate again, offers up prayers. And the people show their affirmation by saying amen. The gathering for the liturgy is also called a synodos. Synodos. Let me see. Yeah. Syn or a synaxis. A way together, which signifies that we are all journeying together and traveling along the same way, that way being Christ. We offer the bread and wine together. It's a communal act. It's not something the priest does. We're not there to watch a show or, you know, uh, reinvent something. We're there to participate and work along with the clergy. St. John says this. It is pot. Look at this. This is really, really, really important because during our own time, this is what's being, um, in my opinion, um, misunderstood and um, also being... Um, I don't know, I can't think of the word, but it's being misunderstood. He says, it is possible, of course, to pray at home. Sure, you can pray at home. Nothing wrong with that. But, but it is impossible to pray at home as you would in church, where there's no, I'm sorry, where there's such a throng of fathers and where powerful prayer is offered up to God with one mind. It's there at liturgy in church. When you petition the Lord on your own, you are not heard as when you petition him together with your own brother. Oof. For here in the church, there's something in addition, the concord and agreement of the faithful, the bond of love, and the prayers of the priests. So prayer in church, at the temple, in person, at liturgy, is more powerful, more beneficial for us than when we pray at home. I'm not saying that. That's what the saints say. Here's another few quotes from the Russian saints. They say, without the visible Holy Church, there would be no holy mysteries of Christ, without which man could not inherit eternal life. Prayers during church services have so much power and significance that just the words, Lord have mercy, surpass all the spiritual exercises performed at one's home. For this reason, the Holy Fathers, while standing in church during divine services, imagine themselves standing before the very throne of God in heaven. St. Anthony of Optina. St. Moses of Optina says, one should go to the morning services because during the divine liturgy, the bloodless sacrifice is offered to God on our behalf. By attending the morning services, we, turn, we in turn offer ourselves as a sacrifice to the Lord. We sacrifice our rest for him. And... St. Ambrose of Optina, finally, it is a sin to spend time in idleness, to substitute church services and one's prayer rule with work is also a sin. So, 
that. Ah, I missed 133. So that concludes our uh, first look at the first part of liturgy. If you guys are free now to um, unmute yourselves and share with us one thing that was new for you that you learned. Let's see. Okay, for some of us, so we were talking quite a while ago about uh, who takes, who takes, um, conducts the liturgy. We have the, you said there were four people. You said priest, deacon, subdeacon, doorkeeper, and you said exorcist. Hmm. Now, I never heard the word exorcist in conjunction with the liturgy. Yeah, so um, even we we have them today. There, I don't know if I can really generalize how many there are, but um, usually it's a priest who um, is an exorcist. Now it's not in; uh, they're not used in the context of liturgy. Um, but I was just mentioning all the different kinds of uh, clergy that we pray for during the liturgy. Um, an exorcist is as the word denotes is someone who, um, you know, if someone is possessed by demons, uh, you know, this priest who is an exorcist will go and, you know, pray over them uh, to get the demons out of them. Okay, that, that's really good. Right. Okay, and then another thing that you said at the end was that it is a sin when you uh, do not come to church because of work. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, for unfortunately in today's world, uh, some people have to work on Sunday. And I, what I disagree with very much is when children don't come to church because of sports things. And right. I, that's something that could be very easily corrected. Uh, you know, we can have sports on Saturday, not on Sunday. Right. Yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, that may, you know, that may never change because we live in such a secular society. Um, but, you know, as Christians, like we, we, I mentioned earlier in the liturgy, we are praying that we will align ourselves according to the will of God that will fulfill his commandments. And we have to try our best to do that, you know. Um, and uh, so even if our workplaces don't permit us to worship freely on Sundays, you know, um, we should be, in my opinion, I think we should be looking for alternatives, um, you know, that other jobs that will respect that, you know, and children need to be reared in the faith so that they know that the most important thing is liturgy and that they'll, they will not conform. We must conform our lives according to God's commandments, not conform God's commandments according to our lives. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, I think that's something that should be stressed, and it also should be stressed about people coming to church. I think people are becoming lazy. Definitely, especially now with the um, the online thing. Um, I know that the intentions are good to reach out to as many people and stuff, but in my opinion, I think that it's now become a crutch, and I can't say i can't judge each person's heart because i don't know perhaps there are legitimate people there who are actually sick so, you know i know people who are sick who legitimately cannot get up to go to church on sundays and that's fine but it you know um obviously we shouldn't substitute that um because we're lazy or whatnot and i think our clergy need to do a much better job at um encouraging people in a positive manner to come to church in person uh, you know, pulling from the lives of the saints, the teachings of the saints of Christ uh, to encourage people to come to church, you know. Um, I feel like we haven't heard that too much in our own day. Yes, because uh, Sabas, what you were just saying about 
you were reading from this, you know, the writings there about how important it is for everyone to be in church together, to pray together. And, and that should be emphasized by the clergy. That's the first time I'm hearing that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that should be also emphasized by the clergy because uh, it's important for people to be there in person. Right. Yep. And to be of a mind together, uh, prayerful and so forth. Right. I think this is all very interesting. And I think if, if people really learned about our liturgy, maybe they would have a change of heart if they really truly understood everything. And I don't think even myself, just listening to this today, I don't just your, your first comment about the first petition, the first prayer, you know, we're supposed to be at peace before we even start. And do people understand, do you even realize that? I mean, it's pretty basic. And, you know, of course I think, yeah, that's the way you should be when you come into church, but do people really get it and read it and understand it? Right. Um, so I think if people understood more about, you know, like people say to me, you guys already did the petitions once. Why are you doing them two more times? <laughs> you know, I don't know why, but you know, I, I, you know, found out today why, you know, it's like, pay attention. Here they are again. You know, you got to get yourself more involved and deeper into the under, you know, deeper into prayer and in, in the liturgy. So, right. I, I, mean, I just don't think people really know our liturgy yeah. and understand that's it. What I was, that's what I was going to say, Diana. But I say, I agree with you. And I, I learned from Sabas and all that he, he has taught us that there, there is so much meaning behind our liturgy, which and so much symbolism and so much. Uh, I don't know. It just everything has a meaning and a purpose, and that's what I learned all these all these times that we were together. How much there is behind the liturgy, which I never knew before. Yeah, right. And and people may have a change of heart if they understood it and yeah. and say, I want to be there. You know. Yeah. And, and that litany of peace with, that we read, I read through some of the. Uh, PDFs, and that really was meaningful to me, to have a sense of peace, you know, mm -hmm. and that church brings you a sense of peace. Right. Allow it to. Right. Well, I want to thank you, Sabas, for all that you have brought us so far, and all that we have learned. Well, you're welcome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next week, uh, are there any questions? Okay, um, we call it. So next week, we're going to uh, meet on Thursday. This was an exception because um, my Kumbada is coming into town tomorrow, so I wasn't able to. Um, but next week, we're going to be looking at. Um, so first off, I'm going to email you right now uh, the, um, the text, uh, my notes, my summary notes of the text itself. Um, so you'll have that. And you can keep that for your records and whatnot and look over it if you want. Um, so next week, we're actually, I, I wanted to uh, talk about the veneration of saints. Uh, because we mentioned the saints probably three, four, five times up to this point in the liturgy. And, um, you know, to an outsider that might be like, why are we talking about the saints, you know? Um, and why do we venerate them? What does that even mean? So um, I'm pulling from another text here that I'm going to email you guys, and it's a pretty short read. Um, it comes from a book called The Truth of Our Faith, and it is a book in which there's this inquirer, inqu how you say inquirer, uh, this, this Orthodox layman from Romania who... Um, wants to learn more about orthodoxy and what you know what they believe what the church believes and he seems to be kind of protestant so uh the protestants don't believe they do not believe in venerating saints praying to saints so one of the chapters is dedicated to explaining why do we venerate and pray to the virgin mary to the saints to the angels you know where what does the bible have to say about those things does the bible even say anything about those things and so this guy, this I think he's Protestant, goes to this very holy elder in Romania by the name Cleopa. He was a modern elder. And he's asking all these questions to the elder, and the elder is uh, responding to him. 
And that's what this book is. And you'll see, you know, it'll say inquire and there's the question. And it'll say Elder Cleopen. And it'll have his response. And his response is very, very, very simple. And it's also very, very like he cites the Bible like all the time. Um, and so it's a really, really great text. This is what he looks like. This is Elder Cleopa of Romania there on the left with, uh, yeah. So um, very holy elder of Romania. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna send you that text next, uh, tonight, right now. Uh, and hopefully you guys will have time to read it. It's really uh, a short read. You probably could get it done in maybe half an hour if you take your time, maybe an hour if uh, if you need to. Um, and um, and so that's going to help you understand why we pray to the saints, why we venerate them, etc. Um, and why we do that in the liturgy, the context of the liturgy. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Virgin Mary, saints, um, some things that you probably might not know. I The cool thing about me doing this is that I myself am learning as well, just as much as you guys. So this is really awesome and I'm enjoying it very much. So we're gonna be looking at that. And then uh, the following week we'll get back into the liturgy, uh, liturgical prayers. So yeah. You'll be sending us an email about all that. Yep, yep. Okay. All righty. So uh, anything else guys? No, sounds good. Thank you. All righty, have, have a good night. You too.